Okay, everyone. Uh, good to be back again. Uh, it's 831. So we're going to start part two of the classes on uh, Shaul Lieberman. Uh, just a few things. Well, first, I want to thank one of the um, listeners who sent me two nice pictures. I, I shared one a second ago, but I'll share it again in a second one. Um, let's see. what Here is one uh, for those who just came on, might not have seen it. Um, this is uh, Shaw Lieberman, Hoshana Rabba, JTS 1971 in his talus. Here's another, I like these pictures very much. Um, here's another picture of him. Also Hoshana Rabba. Notice you see between, on the left is Finkelstein, like a good Litvak, Finkelstein is uh, wearing his tefillin. Uh, why Lieberman as a Litvak, I guess, uh, probably, probably because of his years in Eretz or maybe because of his connection to the Vilna Gon. The Gra, the Vilna Gon was against wearing tefillin on uh, Chol Moed. I've noticed, by the way, today, when I was growing up, it seems like half the people were wearing it. Now it's it's like you can hardly find someone who's wearing tefillin on Chol Moed. I think there's been a decline and people used to stop wearing it. In Eretz Yisrael, the minhag is absolutely not to wear it. In the middle, between Finkelstein on the left and Lieberman on the right, you could see Heschel right there. In these pictures, Lieberman would be uh, 70, uh, was I 71, so that's 70, 73 years old. One other point I just wanna make you about pictures is I showed you this picture last class. Now, the, I don't know how they do this. <laughs> Maybe the, um, the people uh, who know the science, the uh, technical people can. I said, I thought this was a picture with Finkelstein and Rosenthal, uh, Lizzie Shimshon Rosenthal. It turns out it's just with Finkelstein. But look what I'm gonna show you now, because I the picture also appears in the Spiro book. You see Lieberman, you're looking at the right side of his face and you're seeing his right hand. Now here's the actual picture. Oops, so let me stop sharing for a second. Here's the actual uh, picture. You can see it. You're looking at now Lieberman with Finkelstein, but it's Lieberman's left side of his face and his left hand. I don't know how uh, these things are turned inside out and are turned around, but that's what it is. Okay, just a couple of things before we begin the classes, uh, because I, I still have these comments I want to uh, get to from earlier classes. First of all, this is taking us back to class number 20 in my series last. I, Rabbi Weiss from the Village Show in London, I had mentioned that there are two craters on the moon named after Jewish rabbis. One is uh, Abram Zakuto and the other is Levi Ben Gershom. And he writes to me that there's another crater, which I didn't even know about. Uh, lo and behold, uh, let's see, hold on a second here. Here it is. Ibn Ezra. So uh, those who are interested in astronomy, notice that it refers to Ibn Ezra here in Wikipedia as an astronomer and an astrologer. Unlike the Ra Bagad Zakuto, I know nothing about Ibn Ezra as a uh, uh, an astronomer. Unless you're going to say that in medieval times, an astrologer is an astronomer, but uh, he was only interested in, in astrology. I want to show you another thing now. A few of you were very interested in Rabbi Yaakov Koppel Schwartz from last semester. He, the, you remember the Satmar rabbi with all sorts of interesting ideas, uh, provocative ideas. Lo and behold, I'm at a wedding this week. And who's the Masada Kedushin? None other than Rev Yaakov Koppel Schwartz. That's me with him. Don't ask about masks. <laughs> I'm assuming they're all, they all had it. But uh, I took my mask off, uh, and here I am with Rebecca Koppel Schwartz, and um, I met people from his show. It was uh, very, very nice. So uh, with that having been said, let us pick up where we were last class. I noticed that a lot of people were interested in the topic. We have like 370 um, already watches on YouTube, which I think is interesting for what you'd say is a bit of an arcane subject for some people. I, I do want to correct a mistake last week. I confused something. Uh, we were speaking about uh, Shama Friedman and the Israel Prize. I said that first uh, Shama Friedman won it, then Halivni won it. It's the opposite. Now I remembered. It was Halivni won it in 2008. And people were saying that it's not fair. Shama Friedman's been a citizen of Israel since the 70s. And Halivni had only recently, I guess, become one, and he or, and he certainly wasn't living in Israel at the time. 
but he won it in 2008, and then Chama Friedman won it uh, in 2014. Anyone who's interested, you can read this article that appeared in Tablet seven years ago, uh, the year of the when he won it. All about Shama Friedman, his background, and Shai Sekunda says as follows. He's also a big uh, scholar, and he says that Shama Friedman is the most important Talmudist of his generation. And you can read all about it um, here on Tablet uh, if you're interested in knowing about that. One of the things that uh, Shama Freeman's students uh, are doing is uh, they're producing um, academic volumes of the uh, Talmud. So here is just one. See how big this is, how thick this is? One chapter in uh, Masechus Erevin, this is on one chapter, chapter 10, and uh, it's a combination of critical, well, mostly an academic study, but uh, he's really creating a revolution in Talmud study. We'll see how he relate, his approach relates to Lieberman. Um, okay, let us return to the story we're telling, this fascinating story of uh, Reb Shaul Lieberman. The last thing we did was I pointed out that uh, I think I read to you the great rabbis he's related to. We also know that his family was uh, comfortable, so, so we're told. Before Lieberman is bar mitzvah, he sent to yeshiva in the city of Malch. It's called M-A-L-T-C-H. That's how it's, that's how it's usually spelled. Hold on a second. I get a few sorry in here. all my stuff. Mulch, it's not one of the most famous yeshivas, uh, but it was near Motolo, the city he's from. It's associated with Rav Shimon Shkup, if that name means anything to you. The great Rav Shimon Shkup, who together with Chaim Salvech is one of the great Rosh Yeshiva, pioneer of the so-called analytic method. Rav Shimon actually comes to America to, he comes to America to raise money, and while in America, he becomes a Rosh Yeshiva at Yeshiva Shrebitsa Lachana, and he's only there one year, but in all the uh, Wayu literature, when they speak with the great Rosh Yeshiva, they mention Rav Shimon Shkup, as they should mention Rav Shimon Shkup. Uh, if you look in Rav Shimon Shkup's Chidushim, it says uh, Rav Shimon Yehuda Shkup, but he spells Yehuda, Yud Aleph Vav Dalad. Uh, uh, hey, so the, uh, or Al, Aleph at the end, maybe even, but uh, so it's not to put the Tetragrammaton. But he's obviously one of the great Rosh Yeshiva. He was called back to Europe. They say the Chafetz Chaim and Rav Chaim Ozegrzinski said that his Yeshiva was going to fall apart. So he leaves and he returns uh, to, um, to Europe. Um, but when he, he's also interesting because uh, uh, some years ago, there was an article in maybe Haaretz uh, or one of these early papers. He had, his granddaughter was, uh, I believe she was Mapam, completely irreligious, member of Knesset. Her son was killed in the, in the War of Independence, as I recall, but he had a very close correspondence and relationship with his granddaughter, who really represented in some ways, you know, the new Israel, the anti uh, religious Israel. That's Rosh Shimon. We could talk a lot about Rosh Shimon. Maybe we'll have questions on Rosh Shimon. But when Lieberman came there, he wasn't Rosh Hashiva then. He had recently left uh, around 1907, uh, um, and he was not, he, then he went to Grudno, uh, but um, Lieberman comes in 1910. Prior to Lieberman, however, there was another great rabbi, so we know a lot about the yeshiva, Rav Unterman, Rav Isra Yehuda Unterman. We'll come back to Rav Unterman later because of his relationship uh, to Lieberman. He started in Malch when he, from when he was 12 years old. So already you see that this is sort of like a yeshiva like a, we would call it a high school, I guess, a preparatory yeshiva. Even Baranovich, as we saw in our classes, Baranovich, the great Chana Wasserman's yeshiva, that's a preparatory yeshiva. You would go there for a few years and then you move on to the great yeshivas, Mir, Sabatka, uh, Tells. Uh, there was also a yeshiva actually in Malch, as I recall, even before Rav Shimon. Uh, it was run um, Rav Zalman Sender Shapiro. We're told that Rav Zalman Sender, he had to leave uh, Malch because he couldn't take it. Uh, even the young people were infected with Zionism and Haskalah, and the yeshiva ceased to function. Rav Shimon comes, he establishes the yeshiva again. And he also, one of the reasons Rav Shimon leaves Malch is because of the same issues. This was the time of revolutionary feelings and all these things. Uh, you couldn't rely on the students uh, to be uh, faithful in many ways. So he leaves, he uh, mulch, and you could, by the way, you can read all about this in this book. 
very interesting book. It's called uh, Yeshivat Lita Pirkei Zichronot, and it's memoirs of all, lots of memoirs devoted to the Yevorosh Yeshiva, Tels Yeshiva, Sabuk Yeshiva, and then the, the smaller Yeshivas, Malch, Lida, and they reprint Rav Unterman's uh, essay here. Why did he write an essay on Malch? Because uh, shortly before Rav Unterman, Rav um, Shimon dies, they published something in his honor. It was a way to raise money, uh, which had never before appeared in uh, traditional Jewish circles. And Rav Chaim Moser Grzynski has to have a, an introduction explaining why they're doing this. What am I referring to? A Sefer Hayovo. In the academic world, if you look in the Jewish academics, already from the mid 19th century, you have uh, Jubilee volumes in German and Hebrew. Sefer Hayovo, though, that's not really traditional, but, so, but they, they did a Sefer Hayovo for um, uh, Rav Shimon, usually you do it with someone 70 years old, and uh, subsequent to that, uh, no one raises any thoughts about it. You can do a Sefer Yovo. Rav Solveitchik had a very, very nice uh, uh, Sefer Yovo. Uh, so you can read uh, about it uh, uh, there. So who was the Rosh Hashiva of, um, well, the Rav of the city who established, who reestablished the Yeshiva? His name was Rav David Tevel Dinovsky. When Lieberman comes, he's the Rav of the city, he's the Rosh Hashiva. I actually found a, uh, a picture of him. Lo and behold, I found it from Rav Nussan Kamenetsky. Here he is. Uh, Rav David Tevel Dinovsky, Rabbi Shal uh, Malch, and also the uh, um, Rosh Hashiva. Now, why is he in... Um, why is he uh, in Nelson Kamenetsky's book? Before making of a god, he had this Hebrew volume, um, which was, was sort of written by Jonas and Rosenblum, but with all the assistance of uh, Rav Nelson Kamenetsky, because uh, um, Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky had also been there a few years. He, Yaakov Kamenetsky was older than um, uh, Rav Shaul. He unfortunately is killed uh, by the Nazis. There is actually an important letter from Rav Avram Yitzhak Cohen Cook that hasn't yet appeared in his collected letters, although it has appeared elsewhere. The reason it hasn't appeared in his collected letters, I have it here, is because they're going in order, where is it? in order of years. Uh, they're up to about 1930. And this letter uh, to Rabbi Donovsky is from 1934. Rabbi Donovsky wrote this book you're looking at, Likrat Sameh. What does Sameh stand for? I guess thirsty, but it stands for Tzioni, Mizrachim, Orthodoxy. It's all about, it's an opposition to religious Zionism. And uh, one of the famous points of Rav Kook that he responds in this letter is as follows. He writes to Rav Donovsky because Rav Donovsky was uh, concerned, I guess you could say, didn't understand. The point that Rav Kook makes that uh, many people don't understand that Rav Kook writes and all wrote that the nefesh Nefesh is, I guess, uh, part of the soul, I guess, uh, you could determine as the, the nefesh of the sinners is more exalted than the nefesh of the, uh, the righteous ones. But the righteous ones, their uh, neshama, their ruach, I guess you could say, not neshama, their ruach um, is, uh, is, no, the neshama, I'm sorry. Is, is more advanced. So uh, well, how could you say that the nefesh of an irreligious person is, uh, is more advanced than the, the righteous ones? But uh, is it, uh, yeah, so he explains uh, no, the ruach of the tzaddiki. Rav Kook elaborates, um, this is found in the book Halicho Saraya, volume three, in which uh, if you looked at the irreligious, they had a connection to the people of Israel, that is as, as a nation to the land. And he develops the idea that this is from the nefesh, whereas the tzaddikim, they're on a higher level, obviously, and the ruach is on a higher level. The nefesh is, is the lower level of the neshama. But still, there, this is the Rav Kook's great dialectical understanding that even the posha Yisrael, the sinners, they have something that's lacking in the righteous one. So uh, really the best explanation, and he says it comes from Rav Chaim Vital, the best explanation of Rav Kook's whole theory about this, lo and behold, is found in this letter uh, to uh, Rabbi Donovsky. Incidentally, at the beginning, he writes, he says in the beginning of it, he says that I'm not gonna talk about your book, Likrat Sameh, because I don't wanna get involved in these um, the disputes. Uh, 
I guess you could call them quasi-political disputes because you can't decide them. How are you going to decide who's right? And then he says, um, he says, we can't decide. Uh, and he says, those uh, religious people who help, uh, you know, proto-Zionists, I guess you would call them, or cultivate Zion types, they believe that even these irreligious people, they fulfill God's word, that God's plan to be uh, his agents. Uh, and so, um, but it's an important letter. So, as, so Lieberman, he goes to Malch, he studies there under Rabdanovsky. He wasn't there very long before, uh, actually, sorry, Rav Yaakov was not there very long. He goes to Sabotka, but uh, Lieberman would follow him uh, as well. We don't know, though, how long Lieberman was in Sabotka. Rav Yaakov was in Sabotka for around three years. We don't know Lieberman. And in fact, we don't know anything about Lieberman's time or almost anything about Lieberman's time in Slobodka. As far as I know, he, does, he, he never uh, recollects about it. He never mentions, you know, most people went to Slobodka, would uh, refer to the altar of Slobodka. You had Ramosha Mordechai Epstein there, great Rosh Yeshiva. All we have, to my knowledge, is one piece, and it's not so nice, but uh, I will share it with you. Record it from people in the Ruderman family and the Shulman family. The Ruderman family is from near Yisrael, and the Shulman family, the son-in-law, uh, the wife of the son-in-law, the daughter, I should say, Rav Yitzhak Sher, Rosh Shiva of, uh, or Mashkiach of uh, Sabotki Yeshiva. What, where do I get what I'm going to tell you from? It's from this book, Making of a Godel, Nelson Kamenetsky's book. Supposedly, in the next issue of the Jewish Review of Books, I have an article coming out on Rav Nussan Kamenetsky, but I'm waiting for it for a while, so uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, I was asked to write it. In this book, on page 1190, Rabbi Ruderman is quoted as saying, well, let me uh, get the exact, he, it's from Rav Shaftel Neuberger, who was uh, saying in the name of his uncle, uh, that Rabbi Ruderman, who was two years younger than Lieberman, um, he was originally they were supposed to be roommates, but it says that um, here, and this is from Rabbi Ruderman, that the altar of Sabotka moved Rabbi Ruderman out of Rabbi Lieb together with Rabbi with Lieberman and put him in his own home until he's able to find a different room for him. Why? Lest he be detrimentally influenced by his older roommate. Listen, if this was just uh, talk, I wouldn't take it seriously, but uh, it comes from Rabbi Neuberger. It says it comes from Rabbi Ruderman. Apparently, uh, the altar saw that um, Slobodka was not enough for Lieberman, that he had broader vistas. And uh, he thought that uh, Lieberman should not have a roommate. He wasn't thrown out of the yeshiva or anything, but the idea is that Lieberman should uh, uh, be there uh, with it by himself, not with a roommate. However, then... Kamenetsky goes on to quote Chaya Miriam Shulman, who I'm assuming is the wife of Ramonachai Shulman, who also becomes in Israel the Rosh Shiva Sobotka, the son-in-law of, of Yitzhak Sher. And um, she claims, I guess a family tradition, that when Lieberman was, went to the altar to say his goodbyes because he was going to Navardic, Rabbi Ruderman said that uh, certainly he should leave Sobotka. Because uh, from Sabatka, no one leaves Sabatka to become wayward. First, they have to go somewhere else. And uh, Rabbi Ruderman is quoted as saying that he fooled the altar, who thought that Rav Shal had come to learn here, but really he came to see what it was like. I'm not sure what that means, because uh, he certainly did learn there. Uh, and then he quotes, then he quotes finally, Rabbi Ruderman is saying, and this is significant if it's true, that really Lieberman was expelled from Sabatka. Hard to imagine. He claims that Ramosha Bordech Epstein found an excuse to expel him when the altar was away. Uh, likely because, uh, uh, you know, because, quote, he went someplace that the Rosh Shiva told him not to go, which they think is a cinema. I don't know if this is true, and it doesn't make sense with the other story, because if he expelled him when the altar was away, uh, then how could he say goodbye <laughs> to, the, to the altar? So um, I don't know. We will need to... Uh, I don't know if we'll ever know this. And these are the sorts of stories that Kamenetsky's book is full of. Really, uh, you know, X heard from Y, who heard from Z. The exact sort of thing that can't be determined if there's any truth to it. And uh, But at least it's important that in the yeshiva world, this is, the, they call it the hak. This is the, uh, the gossip. 
that they would say about uh, Lieberman. That Slabaka was too small for him, that he had broader vistas, that itself is not a criticism. Um, because as we will see, that uh, Lieberman definitely did have broader vistas. Uh, and um, anyone with his um, ideas about uh, how to study Talmud, even though this will only come later, but clearly the fact that he was willing to go to the Hebrew University showed that he was looking for something, uh, something broader. But let's leave it at that. Uh, I'm just telling you, I, can't, I wasn't there, I can't say. So he goes to Navardic. How much time was he in Navardic? Uh, Navardic is, a, for someone like a, like a Lieberman, might have been a strange place. He didn't uh, recollect about it. Navardic was the most extreme of the Muslim yeshivas. It still exists today, Navardic, but it's not what it used to be. Navardic, David Fishman of the seminary has written a classic article on Navardic. We have other good stuff on Navardic. Navardic was all, unlike Sabatka, Sabatka was what they call Gadol Saddam, to build you up. You're a creation of, of a Kodesh Baruch Hu, you know, to build you up, uh, that you have to live up to what this is. In Navardic, it was called Shifla Saddam, to Push, push you down. And there's all sorts of stories about how, what they would do, these, the exercises they would do to uh, uproot your ego. Uh, I guess it works for some people. I mean, some people go to military academies when they do that, but they would, uh, they would do things in the Vardic they didn't do well. So first of all, they would have beards. They would uh, wear it sits this all to the ground. They'd wear dirty clothes. Uh, as a means they'd confess their sins. That is unusual. Confessing sins? Since when do we do that to, in traditional Judaism? But they would uh, confess to other people. So it's, and when we say Navardic, there was the main yeshiva Navardic, and they opened up all sorts of branches. And don't think you couldn't be a great Talmudist coming on Navardic, this type work. Rabbi Kanievsky, uh, Yaakov Sar Kanievsky, he was, uh, he went to Navardic, but Navardic, it was regarded as um, extreme Musser approach, very different than the uh, the Alter Sabotka. In the past, I've shown you pictures of what the people from uh, Sabotka looked like. I mean, the, the, in their light suits, everyone uh, dressed uh, perfectly. In fact, it's been um, a long time since I showed you this. So let me just see um, uh, if I can quickly pull it up. Um, a great picture. So you get a sense. Uh, um, I think I just found it online. Um, just to, this one picture, yes, I'm going to show you here. It, it, it more than anything, it gives you a sense of what Slobodka was like. And uh, so let's see. Here's a picture of um, these are Slobodka students in Israel, Hebron, when he went to Israel. But just look at that picture. This is Godless Adam. You dress, uh, you can't, you, you, you just, you see them right there. You see that they took pride in how they looked. And I think this is a book about Slobodka in Elita and also in Eretz Yisrael from Lithuania and then to Hevron by uh, Shlomo Tukashinsky. It hasn't been translated to English. It's a great book. The title of it is, you know, I'm learning and also Musser elitism. So, uh, and, and in the book, you see pictures. Uh, there's a, um, I, I, I did a little blog post on it. I'll show you what Rav Hutner looks like, also from Sobotka. This is, uh, he died young, one of the, the sons of the Rosh Hashiva, Ramosha Finko. You know who this is here? Anyone guess who this is on the right? Well, I'll tell you. That's Rabbi Hutner. Uh, the, the, the people, the way uh, they dressed, the way they were, um, it, it, Sobotka was something. I knew someone when I was young um, who had gone to Sabotka in pre-war Europe. His name was Rahana Person. He survived the Kovno ghetto and uh, he had gone to Sabotka. I have a picture of him at my bar mitzvah. So we don't know how long Lieberman was in uh, uh, Navardic. He also studied in the Ukraine, a city, I'm not going to pronounce the name of it, but he, he both studied and even lived in the house for a bit, we're told, by Rav Shoma Palachuk. Roshomo Talachek, the famous Mechitur. We've spoken about the Mechitur so many times. He comes to America. He's the first Rosh Yeshiva, a Yeshiva Shrubitsa Ochanan of uh, world stature. Then he passes away very young because of a gum disease. And it's precisely because of that that uh, Rabbi Revel needs a new Rosh Yeshiva. So he brings in Ramosha Soloveitchik. And then as long as Ramosha Soloveitchik is coming, or J.B. Soloveitchik comes along also. Uh, and he gets a position in Boston and also teaches at, uh, later teaches at Yeshiva. But had Ramosha Soloveitchik remained in Warsaw where he was, had the major turn not passed away, then uh, you probably never would have uh, seen Rav Salvechik in America, and unfortunately, probably would have been killed. But uh, Rav Shoma Palachek, although a Talmud Mufak leading student, Rav Chaim Salvechik was a Zionist, 
was very open-minded. You have just people today in Eretz Yisrael who are descendants of uh, Roshoma Palachek and the religious Zionist world. There's a, there's a street named after him. The, he's known as the Mechitur, the Mechitur Igwe. He shows up and comes to Volozhin. and he's like 12 years old, the youngest they ever had. In previous classes, we spoke about him. And Lieberman receives smicha, where Spiro tells us, Spiro and Shalcha tell us, when he was 18 years old, that would have been in 1916. And by 1919, he's already studying in the Kiev Gymnasium. So like so many others, he wants to broaden himself. He wants a secular education. So he's going to the gymnasium, where the gymnasium, you learn Russian, you learn mathematics, history, all the things you need to learn. But we know very, very little of his during all this period. It's unusual because you think that uh, other than the article, and I'll read you some more later, his article that he wrote about uh, with the Chazanish in Minsk, uh, we know very, very little. During this period, he also marries. He marries, his first wife is named Rachel, Rachel. She's the daughter of the Rav of Minsk. His name is Eliezer Rabinowitz. He is, if you read books, I'll tell you he's one of the leading rabbis in Lithuania. And I think that is a correct statement in terms of, um, I guess, influence, whether this is a gadol, we'll get back to last week's class. He, he was an important person. He was, but he, he, he was an important person in Buddhist Israel, but he wasn't one of the great outstanding Torah scholars when you think about who were the leading gadolim from the Torah scholar standpoint. Um, he, he has a volume of response that only appeared in 1962. His father-in-law, however, was Yochum Perlman, He's known as the Godel of Minsk, the author of the Sefer, the Or Godel. He is a Godel Shebegdol. So clearly, again, that uh, Lieberman, he comes from Yichos, and he's marrying into Yichos. I can just tell you one story about uh, his father-in-law, though, Rabbi uh, Rabinowitz. When the Bolsheviks took over, they put the uh, Navardic students in prison. And um, the, the local community would have to deliver, uh, Minsk would deliver uh, food to them, kosher food. Rabbi Rabinowitz Poskind, you can wrap the food, or you should, perhaps he said, I can't remember, he said you can or you should, probably you should, R wrap the food that you bring them, rip out pages from Gemara, wrap the food in, and bring it to them, because um, that will give the, and, and don't worry that the pages, you know, Torah pages are going to be ruined by that, because this will give them a chance to study Torah. At least now they're being held by the the, the Bolsheviks, or probably it was probably the Jewish the Jewish Bolsheviks, uh, and uh, he thought that this uh, the chance to learn Gemara, learn Torah, rises. It's it's, it's a, have a higher level than the concern of treating uh, Torah pages uh, with respect. I mentioned in previous classes in Olivni's uh, memoir, he speaks about how when, during the Holocaust in Auschwitz, somehow they had one page of the Torah existed. Someone had it, and they would pass that around, and they treated it, it was so precious that uh, in the middle of Auschwitz, there was actually a, a holy page. This family uh, of the, the children, I should say the, the daughters of Rabbi Rabinowitz, they married other interesting people. Another daughter of Rabinowitz married Rav Joseph Shub. Not one of the Godoli Israel, but he was the right-hand man of Rav Chaim Brzezinski. He was like what we call today the Askan, but he was the secretary, basically, of Rafael Moser Grzynski. He was killed in the war. And the third son-in-law, his name was uh, Menachem Mendel Guskin, he was uh, the, the rabbi of, the, of Leningrad under the Soviets. He dies in 1936. So uh, interesting family. We don't know much, though, about this wife, Rachel. She dies in 1930. Um, as a very young woman, we don't know her ailment. If you look in uh, Shochan and Spiro, they give different uh, stories of why she died, including one that she died during pregnancy. But um, there, there's also stories that um, they were already in Israel at this time, Eretz Israel, that Lieberman was so poor he couldn't afford medicine. And that's all sometimes said as explaining why he thought it was important to get a steady position. We don't know it. If she died in pregnancy or something like that, it wouldn't have been because of that. He remarries two years later. He remarries a very special woman, very interesting woman, the daughter of Mayor Berlin, or becomes known as Mayor Barilan, the head of the Mizrahi movement. Her name is uh, Judith uh, Berlin. And I have a, uh, a good uh, picture of them together. Here they are. This is a young picture. So this would have been um, 
about Lieberman, who is about uh, 32, 33. Uh, so that's Judith Lieberman on the left, uh, Reb Shaul, young Reb Shaul on the right. Uh, she was a personality in her own right. You can read about her online, for instance, the Jewish Women, Encyclopedia of Jewish Women, you have a whole article on, um, on Judith Lieberman and her career. She was very involved in Mizrahi women and uh, other things. She even wrote a book. Uh, she, she, she went to, where does it say here? I forget now. Yeah, she had a PhD in comparative literature from Zurich. Um, but uh, she, uh, she published it here, a small book. Uh, these European dissertations are always small. They're not very uh, long, maybe more like a master's, but uh, Robert Browning and Hebraism, a study of the poems of Robert Browning based on the rabbinical writings. Lieberman had such respect for her. You have to see, he mentions her in the introduction to Sefta Kivshuta. Um, she also would become the principal of the, the Hebrew principal of the Shalamis school which today you have two. You have one in Brooklyn and one in um, Long Island, a uh, separate branch. But here is the Shalamis School, which um, I mean, you can read all about, um, for example, the history of the Shalamis School. They'll tell you um, 85 years, founded in 1930. So it's more than 80. They got to, uh, if it's founded in 1830, they got to fix it now uh, 90 years or more. Uh, and then it mentions here, they're not ashamed of this at all. From 1941, Dr. Judith Lieberman served as the Hebrew principal. But what I find fascinating is if you go down, what are they? They say the first old girls yeshiva in North America. I love the fact that they call it a yeshiva. Why do I love that they call it a yeshiva? Because uh, when I was, um, when I had my year in Israel where the girls went to school, they called it a girls yeshiva. My daughters who all have been to school, what do they call it? They call it a seminary. I don't what a seminary mean. Seminary is a if you're training to be a rabbi or training to be a teacher or something. Uh, these girls are not trained to be anything, just going to study. So uh, I don't know, in my time, you can call it a girl's yeshiva. But, and here you have Shalamis, which is more right wing than the modern Orthodox schools I've showed you videos of before. And yet they call it a girl's yeshiva, um, which, um, it also says, hold on a second, I want to see something else here. Uh, I've showed you some other um, uh, schools. I just was curious. Yeah, so Maya Note also. Maya Note calls that I'm looking online now, Yeshiva High School for Girls. So very good. But what I wanted to show you also is uh, here. It is the only religious Zionist girls school in Brooklyn. That's also a big deal because there's lots and lots of schools in Brooklyn. <laughs> you, can, you can hardly walk down the street without seeing a school. But if you're uh, from the older generation, if you're a dinosaur in Brooklyn, that is, you still believe in uh, Zionism. You believe that Yom Atzmut, you shouldn't say, you shouldn't say Tachlun, and maybe uh, Rahman Sunday should even say Hal without a brook or something. You got that one show there, right? Bethel, I guess it is. And, and you got a school though there. You can send your girls to that school. There isn't a boys' school that's religious Zionist. That you'd have to go. Well, that's not sure you go to Flatbush, but if you're so take that back. It's uh, but there's no all boys' school as far as I know. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so that's the Shalamis school. Now, her picture, if you look in Spiro, and I knew this by the way before I saw it in Spiro because I was very friendly, still am, with uh, someone who was very involved in uh, Shalamis. But on page 14, it says after Judith Lieberman's death in 1978, the Shalamis school commissioned her portrait. It was presented to Saul Lieberman at the school's annual dinner in 1979 and was then hugged in the principal's office. Rabbi Moshe Zwick, executive director of Shalamis, assured Lieberman that the portrait would remain there for as long as Rabbi Zwick remained with the school. Now, I know that um, as of, I don't know when Rabbi Zwick left the school, but as of uh, 15 years ago, the portrait was still in, hanging in Shalamis. Um, I can't tell you if it is today. I don't know. But uh, if anyone sends their kids there, you could tell me if uh, her portrait is still there. I have another picture somewhere here of uh, Judith Lieberman, an older picture. Oh, I can't. Uh, yes. Uh, you can't really see it that well. Uh, it's from, if you look up, it's from the uh, Encyclopedia of Chaud Seha Yishuv, Encyclopedia of uh, people involved in building up uh, uh, Eretz Yisrael. Her, she had a sister we spoke about already. Um, actually, no, we didn't speak about it. I spoke about Rachel Margolios. 
um, as a learned Jewish woman. One of her sisters was, uh, I don't know how many sisters, was married to Abraham Halkin, who also taught the seminary, great uh, Hebraist, the father of Hill Halkin. I'm sure people know Hill Halkin, or Philologus, as he's known in the forward. Hill Halkin, by the way, has a, uh, since I showed you the picture before of uh, Lieberman with Atalus, he, he, he records the following from Lieberman, which was said, I don't know if it was said seriously or half in jest, but Lieberman told him, that's his uncle, one day, he doesn't know why he has to daven. He says, God knows everything I need. And also it's Bittu Torah. Spend all this time davening, it could be learning. But then Hill Halkin records that on the Yom No Rhyme, I guess Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, I don't know which one, he saw Lieberman with the talus over his head crying. So it's a typical Litvisha thing, uh, you know, that uh, what's more important, obviously, um, we've spoken about this already uh, numerous times, uh, learning is more important, but uh, he also could be very emotional uh, on it. Uh, Lieberman, who at the end of his life had significant amount of money, in 73, he gave a lot of his money to Israel, the state of Israel, very happily. But after his wife dies, he, he endows, where is it? Uh, there's a, an educational institution called, um, or educational village, whatever they call it, Ramat Shapiro, Ramot Shapiro, um, and uh, Lieberman gave the money to open up this uh, institute, Mahon Lieberman. I don't know what it original, its original purpose was. But hold on a second. Is it? Uh... Yeah, so you can read all about uh, Ramot Shapiro, Merkaz Chinuchi. But now you can see they deal, I guess, with um, personal, I don't know, psychology, family counseling. From a religious uh, standpoint, you can see the teachers there or the instructors. So, so this is, I was shocked, however, I, I went everywhere on the website here and I can't see where, anywhere you go um, concerning. Uh, so you want to read about Mahon Lieberman and it tells you what they are, what they do outside of Jerusalem. But I was unable to find anywhere where it actually explains why it's called Mahon Lieberman. Some people might think it's after Shaul Lieberman or just after any other Lieberman. As far, I can't see anywhere where it explains, that, which it should, being that, uh, you know, there's a focus, as you can see there, on women in, the, in, the, in that whole, um, it's, um, it, it, well, I don't know if it's only women, but it's definitely, uh, there's, I'm just, from the pictures I showed you, you see the, a lot of women involved there. You'd think that they would want to tell people that this is named after a great, religious Zionist uh, woman, uh, Judith uh, Bar Berlin Barilan Lieberman. So uh, I, like I said, I can't find it. And I, I do believe it's a lacuna there. Getting back to uh, original and Lieberman, um, his first marriage. Uh, so how do you make a living? Normally Yeshiva Bachrim, they become Rabbanim or something like that are supported by their father-in-law. Uh, if you look in uh, Shochan and Spiro on page seven, it tells us that for several months he lived in the Rabinowitz home. Then he went to Kiev to work. He worked in the carbon paper business. He went into business with two of his uncles who were involved with coin, making coins, minting gold coins for old, new coins, for old coins. Um, he uh, basically, he was just trying to make a living. Wasn't, and then he decided to move to Israel. Not really. Uh, <laughs> Uh, not, not, not doing so well financially. He had been interested in medicine, however. And uh, after going in 1927 to Israel, he returns in, to Paris, returns to Europe, goes to Paris to study medicine at the Sorbonne. And um, I believe it was Sorbonne. Yes, it was, uh, pretty sure it was a Sorbonne. And, but that only lasts even less than a year because in 1928, he's back in the land of Israel. Where at the age of 30, he enrolls in the Hebrew University. He also he taught in religious school, uh, high school, and then he, he enrolls in the Hebrew University. I don't, I, I don't know what he was doing for money uh, at the time then, uh, because his wife passes away in 1930. Because uh, if he's in Hebrew University, maybe he's also teaching on the side. It's, he, he, he didn't live very well, let's put it that way. So what's so significant about enrolling in Hebrew University? Because he meets someone, he meets someone who's going to have a big impact on his life. And that's, uh, let me show you a picture of him. 
His name is Yaakov Nachum Epstein. Uh, he's usually referred to as Maharin Epstein. He's given that title. He was he born in Brisk. Uh, professor, you know, obviously a big the Torah scholar before he also does the academic route. And uh, he becomes professor of Talmud at uh, Hebrew University. You will see that Lieberman and him have a bit of a break. Uh, we'll talk about that later. But, uh, and he begins to study. For the first time, Lieberman is exposed to an academic approach to Torah study. Yaakov Nachum Epstein, he writes classic introduction to the Mishnah. He was a, a scholar's scholar. And Lieberman is very loyal to him. I'll read you in a little bit what Lieberman says about him in response to the Chazunish. But uh, I just want to read you uh, from um, the, the Lieberman Memorial volume. There's an article by uh, Chaim Zalman Dimitrovsky and uh, another one of these, uh, no, no, sorry, from Shraga Abramson, another one of these Talmud uh, Chachamim who makes his way to the seminary. And he says as follows. It's on page uh, 26 uh, and on. Um, he talks about how Epstein was the first one to expose Lieberman to what does it mean critical study, to the sources of the Tanoim, to uh, the different dialects, the different uh, phraseology uh, they're using. Uh, uh, and he talks about how, uh, you know, the idea of, a, of an Eloi, an Eloi of Elois, but, uh, um, Nevertheless, he knew nothing about academic studies. He knew nothing about the German Torah scholar, the German academic scholars. Uh, so this was a completely new world uh, for him. In fact, uh, Halivni, Halivni uh, says as follows, and this is quoted by um, Shochan and Spiro on page eight. They say that uh, when he re when he arrived at Hebrew University, he didn't know even the names of the great Jewish Western Jewish academicians, including Zachariah Frankel. Who's Zachariah Frankel? Only uh, perhaps the greatest of the academic scholars of the 19th century in terms of study of Talmud. He wrote, Yerushalmi, I should say. He wrote three volumes, uh, Zachariah Frankel, on the Jerusalem Talmud. Here's, the, here's one of them. Believe it or not, it's on HebrewBooks.org, two of the volumes. On Brachos, on Peya, and on Demai, it's uh, if you look, for instance, uh, the pages, it's done. Um, it's like a Tosfos and also like in Rashi. And that's Zachariah Frankel. And Zachariah Frankel was a, a real Lamdan, uh, also an Eloy. But Lieberman had never heard of him. And the questions, we're going to see some of these questions. The questions, though, that in the academic world they ask. See, in the traditional world, the study of Talmud is limited to the way the text you're doing and other volumes of the Talmud to maybe explain what you're doing here. You never ask a question, for instance, in the traditional, traditional study. Well, who says that uh, this answer that the Amora is giving is correct? And uh, what about if we see in the Tosefta, they have a completely different approach to this. Maybe had the Amora known what the Tosefta set re records, then there wouldn't be a problem. And if you look at the Yerushalmi, you see the Yerushalmi doesn't have a problem because the Yerushalmi assumes that Yerushalmi uh, has certain knowledge that they didn't have, and as well as obviously questions of um, uh, you know, philology. You see words that don't look Hebrew. What does this word mean? It's, it looks like a Greek word. So fine, you look up the Arach. But the Arach is a thousand years old. A lot has happened since the days of the Arach. And um, so uh, both from a philological standpoint and also from a... Um, a critical standpoint in terms of the knowledge in front of you. Uh, today, they've even, you have lower criticism. Today, of course, they even deal with higher criticism. We'll get into all this in a little bit. Lieberman is only there. He, he enrolls in, in the age of 30. It's 1928. By 1929, Lieberman has published his first book. Obviously an Eloy. What did he publish? And this is the person who didn't know who Zachariah Frankel was uh, just the year before. Within a year, he publishes, what is it? where is it? Uh, I think I have it here somewhere. Ah, here it is. Look at this. He publishes a little book, Al Hayyiru Shalmi. What is the point of this book? Well, first of all, he tells you to uh, correct the, uh, the, the text of the Yerushalmi. Yerushalmi wasn't studied that much. 
So there's a lot of textual corruptions in it. How do you, how do you correct the text? Well, uh, we'll talk about it in a minute. Two, he's using a different, he has a, a manuscript of Ketav Yad Rome uh, to help illuminate Masacha Sota. And also he has notes and uh, introductions, etc. This is his first book, Ali Yerushalmi, at the age of 31. Now he, if you look in this book, in Yerushalmi, he's 31 years old. He's only been studying in the academic world for a year. Lo and behold, he takes on Frankel. On page 47, he begins. He, he's respectful. He calls him a friend of Frankel. Frankel wrote a book, a whole book, which he wrote towards the end of his life. Like he was only seven years old or something, called Mavo Yerushalmi, an introduction. Lieberman takes on Frankel. And he says that uh, Frankel, in his introduction, he only gives some of the uh, terminologies, uh, the special terminology or shami, and forgets and ignores or forgets many others. And then he says, "What did Franco? Nichshav harbe mekomot ali de iyat yet signal your shami that Franco makes mistakes, a lot of mistakes because he doesn't recognize the special signal, the style of the Jerusalem Talmud. This is the expert in your shami, Franco. He wrote the introduction to the your shami. He wrote commentary in three volumes. And here Lieberman, Lieberman has big shoulders. He's saying that Franco." doesn't understand these points. And he's going to give examples of this. And he gives a number of examples of this. I mean, for, you have to see what Lieberman does. He takes these words in the Yerushalmi that don't make so much sense. And you look at the commentaries, they try to come up with answers. What does it mean? And he amends the text. He says, no. Instead of the word, say, kaf hey yud, it should be kaf tut yud. And that's means a special, he shows how the Yerushalmi has a special way of using this word because it appears in one place and all the other places the word appears, the copyists didn't understand what it meant, so they, they changed it. He is able, when I say it's brilliant philology, it's the sort of thing that only will interest people who are, you know, maybe 10 people in the world, but he is able to show how so many words in the Jerusalem Talmud have been corrupted because the copyists didn't know what the word was. And then the commentaries don't know what to make of it, and they come up with all sorts of theories. But once, and sometimes these words are, are Greek words, and they've been corrupted. But when you put the Greek back in, then everything makes perfect sense. Such a person needs to be a, an expert in Greek and an expert in Latin, an expert in the Talmud. Uh, I have, an, I have an example of this, but I think it'll be too complicated uh, to go into it now. Let me just say, how did he become expert in so short a time? He was all, because he's an Eloi. He knew the Yerushalmi. He knew it. He knew the Bavli. But he didn't know it, though, in an academic sense. So once he was exposed to the academy, well, then everything fit in. And then it started making sense. He already had the knowledge. He just needed the approach. And that's what Epstein gave him. The fact that he knew Yerushalmi is significant, because who learned Yerushalmi in uh, traditional Lithuanian yeshivas? Even today, who learns Yerushalmi? I've said it before, that uh, if you tell people that we found, like a Dead Sea Scrolls, we found, let's say, scrolls with writings from the Tanaim, people would go crazy, you'd have articles, everyone want to see it, everyone want to study it, we got something from the Tanaim. And I, I've said before, what's the big deal? We have writings from the Tanaim, we have the Tosefta. Who reads the Tosefta? We have all this writings from the Tanaim. Uh, we don't need it. We'll first, let the people study the writings that we have. So, as I said, so Lieberman, an unbelievable Eloi. Sometimes there's a rabbi. He should know better. He's got to be about 75 years old. Uh, he knew a little bit about Lieberman. I was on a show once. He said to me, Did Lieberman know Bavli also or only Yerushalmi? You know, I mean, the man knew uh, Bavli by heart, uh, Yerushalmi. So what did Lieberman do when Ali Yerushalmi appears? He sends a copy, of course, to his cousin, the Chazonish. How could he not send it to the Chazonish? And um, from the Chazonish's reply to Lieberman, we see that the Chazonish was not pleased. Now, we do not have the Chazonish's letter, but we have Lieberman's letter to the Chazonish in response so we could see what the Chazonish's problem was with uh, Lieberman. Without getting into, uh, th this is found in uh, Shmuel Guk and Menachem Katz, they wrote an article about concerning Lieberman and his relationship with the Chazonish and uh, Yaakov Nachem Epstein. 
Without, well, first of all, there's the, the, the Talmudic discussion. The Chazonish had criticized Lieberman and Lieberman defended a Talmudic reading. We're not going to go into that. That's most of the letter. But then at the end, Lieberman says, that which you, the Chazonish, said that I called Epstein Marie. Marie, I called Marie Verabi, Rachel Nechamesh, and Marie. If you look, he always refers to Epstein in the early writings as Marie Verabi, my master, my teacher. And clearly the Chazonish wrote to him saying, how could you call Epstein such a title? That's the title, Marie Verabi, you refer to a Rosh Hashiva, your Rebbe. You don't call an academic person. By the way, Epstein is going to be like Lieberman in the sense that Epstein in Berlin, although he's completely religious, his family you know, are leading members of the religious Zionist world, he taught in Berlin at the Reform Rabbinical School as well as other people will see Orthodox Jews taught at the Reform Rabbinical School. Later, when we deal with uh, women's ordination, we'll see that this first comes up in Berlin at the Rabbinical School of the Reform in Berlin, and we'll see what the Orthodox uh, uh, rabbi uh, had to say about that. But um, So Epstein had taught in Berlin at the Reform. You had three big Rabbinical schools. You had the Orthodox in Berlin. You had the Reform in Berlin. Geiger originally taught there. And then you have in Breslau, uh, Frankel's institution, uh, which people identify with conservative. So the Chazanish writes to Lieberman, and you refer to an academic scholar as Marie Verabi. Lieberman writes to him, I don't understand what you're saying. Rabbi, why, why, you know, why can't I call him Marie Verabi? I learned from him, and I think Kama should be translated here, a number of things. He's a completely religious Jew. Ma'amin. He's a believer. He's saying that he's not still learning Torah as an academic pursuit. You had, you had the irreligious people who were scholars. We've always had that. But for them, a Torah study, they, they, they could write a book on the Talmud, but they could also write a book on, uh, on Herod's uh, rule or on uh, Homer's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's just another subject for them. No, he's saying that for him, Torah study, although he's working in the academy, Torah study is, is, is Torah study. It's not an academic pursuit. Vatorah shalamadati, he says mimena, it should be mimenu. The Torah that I learned from him, he Torah amitit v'rod derech maskilin. He says the Torah I've learned from Epstein isn't Haskala Torah, academic type Torah, it's real Torah. And it's the method of the Rabbosenu, of the sages, who search the truth in Divrei Chazal. If Epstein can show you that we've been misunderstanding this Gemara because we don't know what this word means, it's really a Greek word, and now that we understand it, we can understand much better what the Sugi is, how is that Lieberman saying? How is that not Torah? We're trying to figure out what Chazal were saying, what the Mishnah meant, what the Amorai meant. Um, he says... With all the methods, he says, in, in a number of places that are unclear in Yerushalmi, it's been explained to me just through this method. And that's our Yerushalmi. It's page after page of taking text in the Yerushalmi and where he's able to show that there's a mistake in the text or there's a parallel text in Yerushalmi that shows you how it should be understood. All these matters. And he gives some examples from that. Um, he says, if I made mistakes on certain things, well, fine. But... Uh, uh, you know, but I've uh, I, I, I've learned this from Epstein. And then he says, the Chazanish had said to him that, uh, well, let me just read you what uh, what Lieberman says in reply to the Chazanish, and you can see what the Chazanish said to him. That which you said, He said that I'm not really focused on Torah the way I should be. The Chazanish must have said to him, why aren't you in the yeshiva? Only in the yeshiva can you really learn Torah? Here, you're at the university. That's not really learning Torah. Lieberman says, Zef Shar, it's possible that I'm not learning Torah properly. But he says, but they're anili famim sometimes. He says, sometimes after learning so much, I have no more strength. I simply fall down. I sit there with a headache for a few days just on one sugya. And he says, Adarabba, you should request to be Rachamim of Hashem that God should open my eyes. If my actions are not proper, certainly my intentions are proper. What he's replying to the Chazanish is that don't think that because now 
I'm doing an academic approach, then this way, this is at all opposed to Torah study. No, this is just an expansion of what Torah study should be. Of course, traditional Torah study is, is important and vital. And Lieberman would always remain part. If you look into his writings, this is not a replacement. This isn't like Shama Friedman or Halivni replacing the traditional approach with a new approach. No, this is the traditional approach, just widening it. That is, we're not dealing with higher criticism. We're looking at pshat. What does the text mean? Well, if I can show you what the text means because we have a manuscript, or I can show you what the text means because of a Greek word, or I can show you what the text means because I know that there's this one Yerushalmi passage, and uh, we see that they use this abbreviation. So now I show you a word, and what if this word should be replaced with an abbreviation? But the copyist didn't understand it, so he, uh, you know, uh, gave it, you know, offered put another word in. That's pshat. And that's what Lieberman is. Lieberman is not about any grand theories. He's never going to be about that. He's page after page, sugya after sugya, the pshat. We're, you know, he's like a Rashi. Lieberman is like Rashi trying to explain to you what the text means. And he can't understand why the Chazonish sees this as, uh, as, as taking away from Torah in the German Orthodox approach. On the contrary, this would be adding to Torah. The more information we have, the more it helps us understand it. And that's going to be really the path of Lieberman. Oh, I'll, I, oh, I see it's already late, so I'll stop here. We're going to continue next class. Wait to hear what he tells Lieberman, with Ginsburg and uh, give some more examples of, um, of uh, him and his connection to the Yerushalmi. And then he gets a job. And we'll see this will lead us into the relationship with Rav Cook, his job, the, the, the Harry Fischel Institute. Uh, Oh, Harry Fish. <laughs> this is such an interesting figure. We are, so, uh, as I said, we, we still have a lot to do, uh, but uh, I see it's already uh, 827. Uh, so let me take the quest, 927. Let me take the questions and comment on it. Um, Susanna, no, no, that is JTS. Not only is um, it's both in the same place. And wait, I'm holding off because I'm going to, there's another picture of Hoshanas them marching. And wait till you see who's marching. And that's going to be, when we get to the issue of the machitza, or lack of it at the seminary, you will see a picture, and we'll talk about Lieberman's view about, uh, in the Unterberg Auditorium. Does that even exist anymore, the Unterberg Auditorium? I don't know if it exists anymore, but uh, that's the picture where it takes place. Um, Baruch says that Fingosi was not just a good with fuck. He had an atar on his talus. Okay. Well, you know, his father was a, uh, was a real, uh, you know, Rav and uh, Talmud Chacham, and he raised uh, Finkelstein. So, no, he was a um, <laughs> Finkelstein. Finkelstein, uh, towards the end of his time at the seminary, he thought it was such a big deal. He bought everyone time clocks on Shabbos so they could use, I mean, Finkelstein was 100% uh, Shomer Torah and Mitzvah. He was a rabbi of an Orthodox shul at first. Uh, towards the end of his life, like everything else, the seminary moves left, and uh, there was a minion for many, many years in Finkelstein's apartment, he lived very old. He had what we call a Rilchus Yamim. And that minion, after he passed away, um, it then moved to the Upper West Side. Uh, it was called, they called it Orach Eliezer. Because Finkelstein is Eliezer. Uh, Louis Finkelstein is Eliezer Finkelstein. And uh, Halivni actually became the Mara Asra of that minion. It was a completely Orthodox minion. And uh, I used to go to it on the Upper West Side. And it's the only time that Halivni functioned as a Marad Asra, and uh, the shul exists in some sort of it, some sort of uh, transformation in, the, in Riverdale, I believe, uh, Dean and Nyman, Rosh Kehila, but it was a very popular minion. It was in, uh, they rented space in the, uh, it was a youth hostel, like 103rd in Amsterdam, but uh, so when I lived on the Upper West Side, I was there, and, uh, but it was, as I said, it was a completely uh, Orthodox minion. Yeah, so it's a reversal. Ellen says a reversal of the negative. Yeah, but I, I, I don't understand. It's interesting how those come out. Um, and I'm told privately, someone says there's a great book by Rabbi Hamburger about the, the Shorshe Minad Ashkenaz, about Minad Ashkenaz. And uh, volume five has 800 pages about the film Achol Moed and also about the Zohar becoming popular. Uh, there's a lot to say. I believe that the 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 majority the Ashkenazic Rishonim do hold you where to fill in, but the Vilna Gon says not. And uh, the wedding of one of the Williamsburg Hasidim. Actually, it's uh, Borough Park this time, but <laughs> it's uh, 
Rabbi Barry Hartman says, I learned with Rabbi Lifshitz and the Rav and Rabbi David Shia, we regularly studied the Shari Yosher Sefer of Shimon Shkoth. He was very close to his granddaughter, who whenever she came to Grodno was respectful to her grandfather. Yes, this is, I forget her name now, the communist. Uh, um, and look, uh, her, her son died uh, defending uh, the state, uh, or was a pre-state maybe, I forget now. Uh, and Rabbi Shudno says that uh, Rabbi Kamenetsky was his Ion Gemara teacher at B. Sorry, branch of Itri with uh, Rebrovin. Um, someone asked me which branch of the Vardic he went to. I'm not, it was, it, it, I think, I'm not sure. I think it was the you, um, Nav the main one, but it was uh, in exile. Um, Baruch says confession is part of Judaism. I don't know, Baruch, confessing to other people, confessing our sins publicly out loud in front of other people, that's not the Judaism I know. Uh, that uh, sounds more like Catholicism. We confess our sins to God. Uh, in fact, the Sfarim say that you're not supposed to, on Yom Kippur, be too loud because someone will overhear you and <laughs> you don't want it to overhear you. But they would have sessions in the Vardic where they'd come together and you, it was, uh, I think it's also, it's a sense of shame to bring shame upon yourself. They were all about uh, getting rid of the ego. The famous story, which I don't know if it ever happened, but that they would say they'd, um, they'd go into a pharmacy and ask for nails. Today, pharmacy, CVS might have nails, but an old time pharmacy where all they have are drugs to ask for nails. I guess it's like, you call up your local pizza shop uh, and ask, uh, can I make a reservation or something? <laughs> you know, just to do something where uh, where the guys will look at you and say, what kind of stupid thing are you saying to me? They, they would walk around with clothes that was dirty and uh, they were once challenged, supposedly, of, uh, the founders, founder of it, um, um, Rebozo. Um, the Rambam says a Talmud Chacham who has a stain on his garment is high of Misa. So the response was, well, yes, but that's if you have a white shirt and then you have a stain, but our shirts have lots of stains. So uh, we don't fall into that category. Uh, Baruch says, hard to accept it's the only Zionist girls school in Brooklyn. Baruch, you live in Brooklyn. Let me know if there's another one. I don't know. They claim that it's the only uh, Zionist girls school in Brooklyn. And uh, you have to go to Bergen County if you want the other Zionist schools. Let me know if there's another one. I don't know of any other ones uh, because uh, you go to the Israeli Day Parade other than Shalamis, what are the schools marching from Brooklyn? Um, other than Flatbush, but that's not a girls' school, that's co ed. And then you have the Sephardim, the Syrian schools. Uh, it could be that there's, are there any Syrian schools that are, um, see, usually the separate sex schools, uh, they, they're more on the right, so uh, it's hard to regard them as Zionists. Hey, when I went to JC, Rabbi Taitz Yeshiva, we were not allowed to go to the Israeli Day Parade as a school. And I asked Rabbi Tights, Rabbi Tights Sr., or Pinchas Tights, um, also from was in Sabotka, I asked him, how come we can't go to uh, the Israeli Day Parade? And he said, we're a yeshiva. We're not like those Talmud Torahs. That's what he said. JC today does go and march in the parade. But I think what he meant by that is that, uh, without saying it, is that yeshivas don't do things like that. We, they're not so Zionistic. Uh, um, M.S. Frankel says the Mechichov's grandson, also named Shalom, graduated from Columbia in 68, then attended Hawaii for Smicha, even though he never previously attended Yeshiva. Family name provided sufficient protection for acceptance. He later made Aliyah, who and his wife was in the first Princeton class, to admit women. Yeah, we've spoken a lot in previous classes in the Mechichov, so I don't want to just repeat it because many of you have been with me for so long. Uh, but um, very, very important uh, figure. So uh, someone privately mentions the, the Sefer from Rokeach, where he discusses confession to one's Rav, and not necessarily Hashem. The Hasidic Ashkenaz also had interesting, unusual things. So uh, you can find all sorts of interesting stuff among the Hasidic Ashkenaz, uh, which uh, is not, uh, has never been mainstream. That's why they were unusual. Uh, that's all. It's not, it doesn't mean you can't find sources, it doesn't, but uh, we're not, we're talking about mainstream, typical, the way most people would do it. Uh, what you would have, obviously, is you'd have people, not in the sense of confession, but if they sinned, they would ask the rabbi what penance to do. That's, that's different than like reciting your sins out loud, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, Or Shlomo. Yeah, the major term is Shlomo Palachuk. Ah, so Mel says, I didn't know that Or Shalim is in Ramot Shapiro. No relation to me. 
Yachem Epstein is not wearing a yarmulke. Uh, it's hard to know in that picture. In, in Germany, he wouldn't have wore a picture, uh, kippah, um, other than when he was teaching her in Shul. They didn't do that uh, generally. In the picture, which is older, he's from Eretz Yisrael, uh, that might have been a picture uh, outside of, uh, I, I find it hard to believe that when he's teaching, he wouldn't wear a yarmulke. I'm assuming there's no little one in the back. But uh, generally, I can show you pictures of a lot of these German Orthodox types, and uh, they don't have kippahs on, because uh, unless they were in davening or in shul or in yeshiva, just a general picture, they wouldn't wear it. I have a picture, I mentioned this before, in Frankfurt. In Frankfurt, they were very religious at a wedding outside, where all the women are in shadows, because as I said before, the Hershian community in Frankfurt were shadows, the women, but the men are all bareheaded. And so you can't... Uh, we, we've, we've spoken in the past, I have a, there's a picture of well, this, you go on YouTube, not YouTube, you go on, uh, you can Google this and see this, that Rabbi um, Debensal's father, who was a very important person in the Israeli government, he was on the Agronaut Commission, you could see the early pictures, even on the Agronaut Commission, as I recall, he's not wearing a yarmulke, uh, Yaakov Herzog, in, he has pictures in, in, in the state of Israel not wearing a yarmulke. It was thought, it's crazy when we think of this now, but these religious Jews thought that when they were working for these um, labor, irreligious uh, figures, it's like they're working uh, in America or Canada or something, and they felt that they actually had to take off their yarmulke and they were in part of government. Well, may, today it's unimaginable, obviously, but uh, it gives you a sense of what it was like to be a religious Jew in the, in the, say, the late 40s, early 50s, even the 60s in the state of Israel. Um, Rabbi Shudnow says that the Lieberman told us in 73 when he made a huge donation to Israel, that Israel was at the point of God forbid destruction. What will you just say to your descendants if you didn't do everything to save Israel? Yes, he gave, he gave a lot of money. At his death, by the way, in his will, he also gave a lot of money to Chabad, which is of interest. Maybe we'll get back to that later. Can I give some examples of the Greek words? Uh, yes. Well, I, we will, um, when we deal with, uh, he has a whole book called Greek and Jewish Palestine, another one, Hellenism and Jewish Palestine. I'll try to give you uh, uh, some examples of that. Uh, Barry, did Rabbi Epstein from Brisk have any connection with Chaim Soloveitchik? He indeed did, Yaakov Dachem Epstein. I don't know if he ever had smicha, incidentally, uh, although, because in smicha, in, in that you could stay um, all these years in um, Lithuania Yeshiva, you could stay there 10 years, and if you're not going to take a Rabonis, you're not going to get smicha. You, you learn for 10 years, and then you go off, and you, you become a businessman. You could be an unbelievable Amdin, but you don't have, quote, smicha, so I don't believe he had smicha. But he... Um, not only did he know Repliam, he came with a letter of recommendation from Repliam Brisker to Repliam Moser Grzynski to study in Repliam Moser's kibbutz, his, uh, his, his group of Torah scholars that he led in, um, in Vilna, and he didn't get in, even with the Repliam Brisker's either, uh, it's not clear why he didn't get in, but uh, maybe uh, already then, because we know he, he was going to Vilna also, he wanted to go to spend time in the library, the Strasheno Library. So maybe at the uh, Farher, at the interview with Rav Chaim Moser, he made the mistake of telling him that in addition to learning in Rav Chaim Moser's kibbutz, which had all sorts of great people in it, Rav Amiel and others, he might have said to him, and I also want to spend time in the Strasheno Library, and that uh, maybe Rav Chaim Moser said, well then, you're not for me. But uh, the fact that Rav Chaim, and Rav Chaim writes him a letter of approbation, how do I know all this? Because uh, Yaakov Nachum Epstein's granddaughter wrote a memoir, about 100 pages, on her grandfather, and she has an appendix there, and she includes the letters, two letters. Rafael wrote him uh, two separate times letters, and he talks about uh, that he's a young Talmud Chacham, etc. And David Eisen tells us that Epstein's grandson is the author, Yaakov Epstein, the author of Chavon Achlaso, a major religious Zionist posse. He comes out with a volume every single year. We quoted this, if you remember, three classes ago two classes ago, the one dealing with the uh, vegan restaurants, where I told you that in response to Rav Shabtai Cohen Rappaport and, uh, um, well, he didn't write the tshuva, it's um, Fixler, Professor Fixler, Rav Yaakov Nachum Epstein has, an art, has a whole tshuva in response to this about the vegan restaurants. Uh, Gershon Hefner says, Eino lo me well, no, no, he, the, the language he used is that uh, he says about him, uh, I'll read you the exact words. Uh, um, he says, Torah amitit v'lo derech maskilin, ela hi derech rabosenu zal, shemachapsim et ha'emes, 
the divrei chazal. So that's the language. So what does that mean? Uh, the derech maskil. The derech maskili is, uh, I think, what it means is higher criticism. If you look in Geiger and many others, they were interested in. They really they weren't looking at pshat. They were trying to look in a, a much broader way. Trying to, they were trying to show that uh, certain sugyas are problematic because the author of the sugya, the Savaraim, the Stam, whatever you want to call it, even the Amaraim didn't have all the facts. And they're trying to recreate it. That's you find that in Halivni, Felbloom, that but that's what you already have Geiger doing. I think that's what he means. But Epstein is not doing that. They're interested in Pshat. Catherine says, if anyone has a photo of Herbert Danby, the Anglican priest Liebman collaborated with would be great to see. Well, you can, uh, I, I've, had, I've seen photos. I'll pull it up right now. I'm sure if I Google it, you'll get it. But you say, um, Herbert Danby was a uh, canon. Uh, hmm. When I look for images, I don't get an image of him. I've seen an image. I just get of his the books. Herbert Danby was uh, in Jerusalem, the Anglican um, canon, and, that, and he translated the Mishnah. He also translated one of the volumes of the Mishnah term, the Yel Judaica series. But in terms of um, collaboration, you're going to have to tell me what they collaborated on because I don't know of any collaboration. Uh, uh, I thought Unterberg it was, is a big uh, auditorium. I've asked two rabbis, conservative rabbis, the picture I'm going to show you later, and they think it's that isn't Unterberg. Um, Israel says, why do so few people know about Rabbi Lieberman? Do you have to meet him like a standard rav? Would have that spread his name or create popular works? Well, first of all, you might be asking from the Israeli, from the yeshivish world. I don't know. In the yeshivish world, they wouldn't know him because he's not part of that world. In the in the non-yeshivish world, I think among the re religious academics, everyone knows him. In the conservative world, there was a time that everyone knew him. In his day, he was much more popular than Heschel in terms of influence. Now, who remembers Lieberman? Who remembers Finkelstein? Everyone knows Heschel. But that's because the seminary and conservative Judaism has moved away from this, you know, the focus on Talmud at the seminary. That's Heschel. But in Heschel's lifetime, he was so marginalized. It's a great example of Achrei Mos Kedoshim to you. Heschel was marginalized, completely pushed aside in favor of the Litvox, the Talmud department. But now, of course, I, and they thought Heschel was crazy going off, you know, marching with Martin Luther King. But today, people look at Heschel and they see it, it brings great pride that here he was doing all these wonderful things for civil rights and his books on the Shabbos and the prophets. They're great stuff. Anyone could benefit from them. But um, that was not the case uh, during uh, when Lieberman was there. And you, you, know, you it was it was academic study of Judaism. Now, of course, with neo Hasidut and everything like that, Heschel is very appealing. But uh, they uh, even Finkelstein, they, they didn't have much patience for uh, for anything other than academic studies. Did Lieberman have any children? Uh, no, he had no children. Um, Nelson Kamenetsky writes in his book, Making of a Godel, that explains why Lieberman could make unconventional choices with his life, because he didn't have children. He didn't have to marry them off. He wouldn't have to explain, you know, why is he teaching in the seminary? At the same time, he'd be sending his kids to one of the yeshiva godolas. You know, it's, he didn't have to make those choices because he didn't have children. So that's, and I, I think that's a very interesting insight from uh, from Nassim Kamenetsky. He says the same insight about Rabbi Chiyak of Weinberg and also about the Chazonish, that these three figures didn't have children, so they were able to make choices that would be unconventional. Yes, obviously the Roman Catholics don't confess straight to God, uh, they confess uh, through a priest, uh, correct. Baruch says the Navardic stories might be rare or apocryphal. The, the one about uh, might be apocryphal about the nails, However, if you read, for example, Moshe Silberg's memoir and others, you see that Navardic was, it was Shiflus Adam. It was, um, and you have to, the best article is on David Fishman. You see that they cultivated a, a very different sense, a psychological sense. And privately, someone emails me about Godolin who worked film, Bechol Moed. So you mentioned Revisus on Meltzer. He did. Revisus on Meltzer, but privately, not publicly. Baruch says, Gemara doesn't say that dirty shirt is high. Misa talks about a specific type of stain on the garment, not any dirt. Listen, Baruch, it's a kasha on a misa. 
the story is that they're asked, why do you have a stain on your garment when the Rambam says, Yechayev Misa? And in, and in the story, they don't reply because the Gemara is referring to a different type of garment. The story is that they reply uh, because our entire garment is dirty. Now, did the story ever happen? I don't know, but it's not important. It's the, the fact that we tell these stories is what shows what people were thinking about them. Um, M.S. Frankel says the president of Breuer's or Breuer's grandson and the rest of the other didn't wear a kippah at work. Uh, yeah, that's Aaron Bart, famous Aaron Bart, who wrote an important work, a very nice work. Uh, Judaism Faces Eternal Problems. It was in Hebrew, translated to English. Uh, an old time German Orthodox Jew, the son of Yaakov Barth, professor at the Berlin Rabbinical Seminary, great biblical scholar. He was the president of the Bank of Israel. He did not wear a yarmulke. Every picture of me, you don't, you don't, don't see a yarmulke. To someone told me a great story that he was at some banking convention somewhere, and all of a sudden he hears thunder. And he takes his yarmulke out of his pocket, puts it on his head, makes the bracha, and puts it back in. And uh, that's German orthodoxy was uh, is, was interesting. They didn't wear a yarmulke in the schools, in the Jewish schools. We spoke about this. We know this. Uh, someone privately emails me that in the um, Six Day War, the New York Times ran a front page story. They referred to a professor who gave twenty five thousand dollars his life savings. Yeah, it's a famous story. Lieberman didn't deny it was he, but he was insulted that this contribution was described as his entire life savings. And we know that he had a lot more money. He was given a very nice salary. He must have invested it very well because at, at his passing, his the executor of his estate was Dov Zlotnik. And uh, one, he gave, he left a, a good amount of money to uh, Chabad, uh, which he, I don't know if he had any real relations other than sending his books to the, the Rebbe. I don't know what else. Um, Okay, someone privately says that Unterberg is, is the base medrash, but uh, the picture I'm going to show you, wait till we see the picture when we get to dealing with the seminary, because the, the, the room I'm going to show you was much bigger. How was the Chazunish unconventional? I, that, that was the question I had on um, um, Kamenetsky. I think what Kamenetsky means is not in the way that Lieberman or Weinberg were, but for instance, his rejection of the analytic method, which I wouldn't say it's unconventional, his opposition to Musser, you know, making choices that go against the grain of the yeshiva world, I guess. Maybe that's what he had in mind. Okay, um, I'll say one more thing before we end. Oh, do we have correspondence from the Lubavitcher to Libran? I think you just have like a letter thanking him for his, uh, for sending him things. But uh, we, we didn't see that, uh, and we'll get back to it later on, that the Rebbe told, and there's a video of it where the Rebbe is speaking about Lieberman. He, when Zlotnik goes to the Lubavitch Rebbe, I'll show you the video. I showed it to you last semester. Uh, but uh, the reason Dimitrovsky, like I said, last class remained at the seminary is because uh, the Rebbe told him as long as Lieberman is there. Um, I'll just end with... Um, one final comment, because uh, someone mentions that Zotnik had a good relationship with Ray. No, no, actually, let's hold off on this, because when we, we, I want to deal with the seminary in America. Lieberman, to a certain extent, is the one giving it legitimacy. So all these people, the, the old joke about the seminary was it's orthodox professors teaching conservative rabbis to minister to reform laity. The whole Talmud department is really, I mean, is in the shadow of Lieberman, and he's, we'll see how he tries to build it up. Uh, okay, uh, it, it, I've spoken long enough. Thank you all. Um, Rabbi Kelman uh, couldn't be with us tonight uh, because he has a, a different engagement. So I will just then say uh, um, uh, good night to everyone. Thank you all for coming, and uh, God willing, we'll see you all next week.